I'm, I'm just going to do a brief introduction and then we're going to jump into it. Our topic for today is disability and the law. And we have two wonderful lawyers who have donated their wonderful time um, to come talk to us about sort of the life and in the way that I'm framing it of like disability and the law. So we have Keith who's going to talk to us about education and law. And we have Jennifer, 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 who um, is going to talk to us about the workplace and public, more public accommodation issues, right? Um, Steve is an attorney who represents local boards of education throughout the state of North Carolina. His practice is focused on special education law, personnel law, and general litigation defense on behalf of school boards. And he taught middle school before becoming a lawyer. Um, Jennifer is a litigation attorney for Noble Law. Prior to her time at Noble Law, Jennifer served as a senior attorney at Disability Rights in North Carolina, where she worked for nine years to protect the rights of dis people with disabilities under the ADA. Jennifer teaches disability law as an adjunct professor of law at UNC Chapel Hill. So thank you for coming over to the side of campus. Um, she frequently lectures and teaches CLE courses on employment law topics including the ADA, FLMA, sexual harassment, and ethical issues in representing clients with disabilities. She has also served her community, um, including on the Carver Elementary School Improvement Team and on other nonprofit boards and volunteer committees advocating for racial equity. So, we're going to ask Steve first and then Jennifer, and thank you. Thanks. I'm captioning us having audio issues, but I'm able to hear. So I don't know what to do. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Amelia said, I'm Steve. I'm a lawyer. And so we'll start with the lawyer stuff on the next slide here. A uh, quick disclaimer that the uh, PowerPoint here is very bare bones. I uh, had to condense a lot of that. I know Jennifer does a lot of these trainings as well, um, that I had to condense this down from really what can cover an eight, nine, 10 hour training into 45 minutes while building in some opportunities for discussion. So uh, this is gonna be just really, really bare bones. Text to the law so you can find, kind of follow along with what I'm saying, illustrate. It doesn't have any of the fun uh, embedded videos or things that I uh, often like to try to do. So. Um, as Amelia said, I represent public school boards. Uh, so a couple things that I need to do if you ask a lawyer to come talk, you get the lawyer stuff first. And that is a couple things. One, I represent boards across the state of North Carolina. I am not here today speaking for them, right? So nothing I say today is the position of any county school board that you or kids may go to or that you uh, may see about in the news, things like that. Uh, so please, those of you here and, and anybody listening on, online, make sure that you understand this is coming from my personal experience, my own interpretations of uh, information and law, uh, but should not be attributed to any of my clients. Second thing is as an attorney, uh, I am speaking here in just an educational capacity. I'm not offering any legal advice. If you have questions, I would love to answer them. Please ask me hypothetical questions. And I cannot tell you about what your child is going through or what your school, your child's school has done uh, but if you have a general question or even a detailed hypothetical, I can answer a hypothetical question. Um, as I already said, that I really had to condense this down, so this is very, very high-level stuff, um, and it's probably going to leave you going to make fun. Uh, that's okay, because I'm <coughs> six years into this career, and I'm still doing that pretty much every day. So, uh, But stop me as we go. As, um, as a presenter, I'm much more comfortable having a conversational uh, opportunity here. It's probably why I didn't make it as a middle school teacher. Had to become a lawyer. It's much easier, by the way, to be a lawyer than a middle school teacher. And those folks who end up in middle schools have my infinite respect. Uh, but in terms of the, uh, the rest of the disclaimer here, that, that the one thing I wanted to start with was this reading that y'all had about the Georgia Public Schools. Um, I wanted to make sure we weren't all coming to this thinking that's what special education looks like in most places. Um, that article is horrifying, and you know, as I was reading it, I was I was between you know, tears and, and rage. Um, and there are some real problems all around the country with how we educate, how we provide educational access to students with disabilities. But that's not what it looks like. You know, I work with with folks who are just giving their hearts and their souls to this every day. Uh, and the vast, vast majority of them are just doing wonderful, wonderful work with wonderful students uh, who are just learning a little bit differently than uh, the students, their, their non-disabled peers. So uh, please carry that with you, right? That article is important, um, but 
please don't attribute that to every school system that you encounter. Um, so what do I want to do today? Uh, we're going to skip bullet one because I didn't know Jennifer was coming to do that. And she's far more qualified and, and readier to uh, cover that. So I'm going to go ahead and just excise bullet one. And we're going to jump straight into just the educational context for students rather than working and looking at how schools also have to incorporate uh, working with employees with disabilities and, and how we accommodate that, how we make sure that schools are compliant uh, with their various legal obligations with their staff. Um, so I'm going to skip through a few of the first uh, slides here, but I'm going to stop here because the ADA definition of disability carries through into 504 uh, in the school system, and I didn't reproduce the slide in the 504 section, so we're going to stop here. So first thing, uh, what is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act? In really, really condensed terms, all it says is you can't discriminate against people with disabilities in the provision of public programs. And so what that means for schools is any educational program that we are providing to non-disabled students has to be made accessible to the maximum extent possible with reasonable accommodation to students who have disabilities. So if we have students who have mobility needs, our school buildings need to be accessible to those students. If we have students with uh, hearing needs, right, and you watch the video of the Detroit public system, and again, how, how depressing uh, some of these, these stories can be. Uh, but we have an obligation to make sure that those students have access to uh, their education, even though they do not hear the way that their non-disabled peers do. Um, that also extends to non-instructional programs, right? So it's not just that you have to have access to math class and reading class, but you have to have access to the football team and to the dance program and things like that. So any program that is funded at the school as part of the instructional program is something that the schools have to be thinking about. How do we make sure that this is accessible to students with disabilities in, in the same way or in an equal way to uh, their non-disabled peers? So when we think about what does it mean for a student to have a disability, we're gonna have two different areas that we're looking at. One is Section 504, that's where I'm gonna start. Uh, but I'm gonna spend most of my time with the IDEA. And so in terms of the provision of special education services to students with disabilities. Um, and they have slightly different definitions of disability. So we wanna make sure we separate those two out. This is your ADA definition of disability and it applies to Section 504. So we're looking for either a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Again, there are about 10 slides that follow this that got cut, so let me summarize them real quick. <laughs> um, major life activity is really just anything that you would do in your average day that's important to your ability to function in society that would be limited by that disability in a, in a significant way. So walking, clearly uh, a, a major life activity. Right, breathing, major life activity. But some of the ones that people don't think about, concentrating, right, major life activity. Um, so a lot of different ways that this can come at uh, a student's ability to access their educational programs, and we need to be thinking about all of those. There's no definitive list. Congress did not create a law when they made when they made the ADA or Second Amendment that said these are the major life activities. Right, it doesn't have. There's no uh, just all inclusive list. So we need to be thinking and adapting based on what we're seeing as students come through our system, how does this impact them and does this qualify? And if it does, then we need to be moving on into Section 504 protections, thinking about how we provide access and services to that. Um, Y'all let me know if this broadcast is looking weird if I get too close to the camera or something. We're good, okay. Um, these last two bullets, I think Jennifer will probably spend a little more time on than I will uh, because where Section 504 for students is really focused is gonna be this first bullet, right? When we're worrying about the, the actual impairment. Uh, there's, there's less issue with uh, records of such impairment or being perceived as such a, uh, having an impairment. It's not irrelevant, but it's far less common. Um, so we pause there. I am not gonna be able to stick around for the discussion at four o'clock, so please feel free to interrupt me. As I said, a conversational piece that may be a bad middle school teacher, uh, hopefully makes me a decent instructor when it, when we have that opportunity to engage professionally. So please, if you have a question, um, or I did say something that's unclear, just stop me and we'll go through and uh, I'll probably do a little uh, jump whenever I hear that sound that says somebody posted something on the site that's watching, but uh, if those want to be passed along, I'm happy to answer those too. Um, so, okay, so let's skip the rest of the ADA slides. Okay, 
Section 504, in our school setting, here's that basic summary that I already gave uh, in preparation of that, what definition of disability is here, but uh, this is the slide that's going to tell you what our obligations are in paraphrase. What does that look like? So what do we, how do we do that, right? How do we operationalize going from this is the legal obligation to a student in front of us in a classroom and serving that student and meeting that student's needs? So for Section 504, first thing we need to determine is, is this a student that's covered by Section 504? Are they eligible for the types of accommodations, modifications that Section 504 guarantees to them? And we need to be looking at that question. Do they have a disability? Here's that definition again. And if they do, what does it mean? Right? There are lots of students that are walking through our schools who have a disability, who function perfectly fine, without any accommodations, without any modifications. There are a lot of students who walk through with a disability that probably could use some accommodations and modifications, but maybe we didn't catch it. Uh, so just because they're not getting it doesn't mean they may not need it. But there are lots of students who are able to function on the same level as their non-disabled peers without accommodation or modification. So 504, the next step is saying, do you have a disability? And then does that disability mean that you need accommodations and modifications in order to access the program? And if you do, then we have an obligation to provide. So when we think about that, one of the things of questions that we get with teams is, well, what if a student's on medication, right? We have a student with ADHD. Let's just to pick a really common example um, that is very well managed by their medication. And because of, of where they are or, or their uh, socioeconomic status, they do have access to that medication. They do have consistently the opportunity to take that medication, whether it's at school or before and after they come to school. But it's all, it's all fine. And if the kid's on their, their medication, you have no idea. Right? Can we consider that when we think about eligibility for 504? No. Right? And that's something our teams struggle with sometimes, is looking and saying, well, we don't see it. We don't see it. Well, you don't see it because it's really well managed by medical uh, intervention or some other support that the student is, is getting more generally. That's not enough. So we, we cannot look at a mitigating measure and say, okay, that takes care of it, not eligible. And so we need to look at, hypothetically, what is the student's needs without that mitigating measure, without that medication, without that support? Then would they be eligible? And if the answer is yes, then we move in to that second question. Now, we do get to look at mitigating measures when we think about whether an accommodation or modification is needed. So a student, again, with ADHD who may have um, a lot of just pent up energy and need to move. And, and I think the, my, my wife is here. I may reference her as a much better teacher than I ever was. But we both had students as we were teaching who just had a need to move. And, and we have this idea, this kind of 1930s idea in some classrooms where you know, we, have to, we have to sit and we have to get and we're in this, this sort of uh, assembly line type of instructional model that hopefully has been left behind in the last century. But um, some students don't work that way. They just need to move. And so if they're able to not disrupt the class and they're able to learn while they're doing this, why would we stop doing that, right? That's a pretty simple accommodation. And, and I've, we've had teachers who they'll just set out like a taped line. And this, is, like, this is your movement box. You don't need to be in your desk. If you need to get up and move, go back in your movement box, bounce around. You're good, right? That's an accommodation. That is a way that we can change the program so that that student is able to access their instruction just as effectively as their non-disabled peers. And you know what? People say, oh, well, isn't that distracting? It's really not. It takes a couple days for the other kids to get used to it, and they only see it. So it's one of those, it's really some, sometimes really simple things. You can be creative, uh, but we can't just rely on go get some one, right? That's not good enough. Uh, so we do not consider that for eligibility, but we do consider it for when we go to their accommodation needs. If it's if their medication is managing it, they don't need to get up and move, great. Then we don't need to make that an accommodation. But if they do, then that's what we provide. And we find a way to do that that works with that student, that works for that classroom, that works for that teacher, and we build it into their 504 plan. Um, so 504, big picture, what do we want our school teams thinking about? Kind of boil it down to this, how do we give this student a fair opportunity to participate? And, and that fair opportunity is a really important piece of language. It's a paraphrase. It does not come from any law. Um, but the idea here is a 504 plan, and when I get to IEPs with the IDEA, and an IEP plan is not a guarantee of success. You cannot hold a school to that standard, that once you put that plan in place, that we are making a promise, this will work. 
right? What we have an obligation to do is create a plan that we think is likely to work. And then if it doesn't work, then hopefully we're coming back together, we're collaborating with parents, we're collaborating with community resources to make a better plan. Um, but we're, it's not a promise, right? A 504 plan is not a promise of success. It's not a guarantee. And so that's where that fair opportunity comes from. Is based on this plan, is this reasonably going to provide the student an opportunity to access their education on a, a fair basis, an equal basis with their, their non-disabled peers? Uh, and this last point is really important because sometimes we get the big arguments with parents and they're saying, well, you're not doing enough. My son can do more, right? My son has infinite content potential. And, and the teachers are sitting there saying, we agree. We agree with you. We believe in your child. But that's not the legal obligation, right? We can't do that. We cannot promise maximum outcomes for every student through these plans. Hopefully, as a policy matter, we're pursuing that and our teachers believe in that um, and they're doing everything they can. But from a legal obligation standpoint, our, our obligation is that kind of basic floor of opportunity. Do we make sure that everybody is starting from a place that's fair? Um, and then hopefully we're going to work to make it better throughout. Uh, but please keep that, that point in, in mind in particular. So when we talk about Section 504, the big focus is going to be on accommodating and modifying. And those are slightly different terms. They generally come as a pair. You'll hear the accommodations and modifications. They're not quite the same thing, uh, but it's really for today. It's okay just to put them in together. Uh, but what does that mean? It means we're going to take whatever aspect of the education is the barrier and think about how do we shift it so that that barrier is not in the way anymore. And so if it is a physical space issue, we figure out how do we make this physical space work for this child. If it is a form of instruction, how do we figure out how that instruction, right? Some students, again, to go into the, um, the video you watched of the Detroit students, if they can't hear the instruction, well, how do we make sure that they can still access the instruction? That means that their teachers should not just be at the front of the room lecturing with no visual supports, with no materials they can follow along on. Uh, you know, not every school is going to have the resources to do closed captioning for every classroom or things like that, but we can be creative. We can get them notes written ahead of time for them to read while the teacher's talking. We can have PowerPoints that they can read, that the teacher can refer to. Um, ideally, we've got a situation where we've got an interpreter available. Uh, when necessary. It's not always possible, but, it, but that is something certainly that, that schools are looking at. Um, do we have specialized programs? Yes, but we also have an obligation to have them in their least restrictive environment. I'll get to that more in the IDEA uh, piece, and I'll come back to that Detroit uh, video because there was a lot of conversation in that video that, that was actually inconsistent with the least restrictive environment mandate uh, that schools are operating under. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we get there. So just some examples. And again, this is one of the have this conversation with, with school teams all the time, uh, because sometimes they're a little bit hesitant to be really creative, right? There is a, you, you can make the joke at any, uh, any presentation to a large group of teachers, say, you know, quick, think of the most common two accommodations or modifications that show up on 504 plans and IEPs, and it's going to be extended time and preferential seating. And they all laugh because they think it's, you know, because it's like, oh yeah, I know that, right? As a professional, I get IEPs all the time. And the only things that are on there are extended time and preference seating. Well, that's great. Extended time can be very helpful for a student who has trouble concentrating, who is for a student who has dysgraphia and maybe has hand cramps as they're writing, if they have hand right. Um, so that's really important, but it's not always enough. Preferential seating is great. Let's be a little more specific. Do we want a student at the front of the room because they have trouble concentrating if they can see their peers? Do we want a student at the back of the room because they have social anxiety? And if you put them at the front of the room, they think everybody's looking at them and now they can't concentrate. Right? A lot of times we just assume preferential seating means next to the teacher or up at the front of the classroom so they can see the board if they have bad eyesight um, or they can hear better if they're hard of hearing or they can focus because they have concentration problems. But it's not always true. Sometimes it just means they need to be away from peers who engage in distracting behavior. And then the teacher needs to be able to perceive where that is and put them in a preferred seat that's wherever it may be that's away from those distracting peers. It may be that they, like I said, they have social anxiety, and, and I've had this with students where they will absolutely refuse. Their IEP just says preferential seating. The teacher reads it and assumes it means right up by the teacher, and they're mortified. And they will then skip class, 
or they will refuse, they'll get, you know, they'll do something to get thrown out of class, right? And it's all because we didn't spend the time to communicate. Say, oh, oh right, preferential seating for you means the back of the room or the side of the room or near the window. So you can look, because some students can look out the window and hear everything that's going on and learn it just like that. So it's a very individualized inquiry. Um, and I've, I've found that, you know, teams are, they're really good at this, but sometimes they're a little bit hesitant to be creative. And so I really try to encourage them, be creative, talk to the student, talk to the parents and come up with it. Be as, you can be as uh, inventive as you like, because again, there's no list. You have to go through the checklist and say, oh, well, okay, we, got, we have 257 options for the student. And no, right? It's whatever you as a professional think is appropriate. And people sometimes forget that, that our teachers are professionals, highly trained, well-educated, and doing a job where they don't get the respect they deserve, and they don't get the pay they deserve, and they don't get the support they deserve. Um, they're really fantastic people, and they have really good professional judgment for the most part. And so we try to encourage them, go ahead, believe in yourself, do that. Uh, and, and they do a really nice job of that. So these are just some examples um, of the accommodations and modifications to the class. Is that clock accurate? I'll make sure that we build it. Okay, cool. Um, then we have time to take some questions as well. Again, I haven't seen anybody make a face at me yet, but please do ask a question if you have one. So let's move, let's transition here. 504 into IDEA. That's 504 in a nutshell. We just, we just got a year's worth of uh, 504 in 17 minutes. Uh, so let's, let's try to compare that now to the IDEA because that's really where we see the bulk of our work. Um, 504 and IDEA have two kind of different mandates, not dually mandates, different mandates. Um, 504 is about preventing discrimination. Right? You cannot deny a student access to a program based on their disability. So it's just you know, level the playing field, basically. Uh, make sure that they can access it. Anti-discrimination, so it's a prohibition. There are literally no affirmative obligations there. It's, you can't do this. You cannot discriminate. So you have to think about ways that you make sure that your program is not discriminating. The IDEA is an affirmative mandate. It's built through a funding statute. That's how Congress controls the state's behaviors, and that's of federal courts and comedy, uh, or uh, federal courts and, and uh, separation of our, our uh, state versus federal system. That's very poorly articulated. That um, Congress is not allowed to just tell states all the time what they have to do. They have to say, we'll give you money if you do what we want you to do. And that's what the IDEA is, right? Here's all this money that you really need, but if you're gonna take the money, you have to do all these things. And that's, that's how, they, that's how the, the federal government imposes those obligations on the state. That's why it says funding statute there. But it's an affirmative obligation. You have to do these things for students who are eligible under the IDEA. It's a much more comprehensive set of regulations. It's a much broader, um, more detailed set of, of expectations, which is interesting because it's a narrower, field, right? 504 covers a lot more students than the IDEA does. Um, and so 504, you get your accommodations modifications. The IDEA is if we need to go well beyond that. Um, so here's our one graphic for the, yeah. How often do uh, the funding removed because they aren't meeting the 504? Uh, somewhere between exactly never and exactly never. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it is plausible, but really, again, it's one of those that the the, the law can be enforced without taking the money. That's what, right. what, what, what happens when? Yes, so so I didn't spend a lot of time in this PowerPoint, but we can talk a little bit about what it looks like when uh, a, a parent, a child is dissatisfied with their uh, services or they feel they should be getting services and they're not. Um, and there are procedural rights that are built in to the IDEA as well as Section 504. They look a little bit different. Um, that give parents the opportunity to challenge decisions that are made by the school, to say to the school, you're not doing what you're required to do. So it's not a, not a we just have to get the federal government to pull their funding. This, frankly, it's just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, but, so I do have a slide, but I wanna make sure we put a pin in that one, because there's when we get to the parents' rights slide and the due process petition, I wanna talk a little bit more about what that looks like. That's a huge part of my life, um, sadly. And uh, you know, we work very hard to stay out of that. But, <laughs> Part of my, I only get called when things go wrong, right? So I, I only get to see those situations, you know, the 98% of things that are going really, really well, they don't call me. And that's good, but it also get, gets me a skewed, kind of depressing view of things sometimes. Uh, so this is 504 and IDEA, right? If you're under IDEA, 
you're going to be technically eligible for 504. That's it, almost as a rule. So, but you don't generally have an IDEA, an IEP, and a Section 504 plan because the Section 504 plan is going to be kind of built into the IEP, and then law makes clear that you don't have to have both. We do have students that do have <coughs> if their 504 needs are completely distinct. So if they have a learning disability and they have a G-tube, right, um, for feeding needs, that may be handled through a health plan through 504 that has nothing to do with their IEP, which is related to a specific learning disability in that. So you can have both, but it's, just, it's pretty rare. Um, but any student that is under the IDEA is going to be technically eligible under 504. Okay, so differences in eligibility. What gets you under one versus the other? We already talked about 504. There's the, it's the third time you've seen it now. I think Jennifer's going to talk about it a little bit as well. So you're going to have that one down when we're done. Uh, but the IDEA is very specific. So you have to meet the definition of a disability as laid out in the IDEA. And that's different. It is not this definition. Nice of government to do that for you, right? Disability means this here, but it means this here. Uh, in the IDEA, we have specific categories of disability that are then defined, and that's done by the states. It's generally consistent with what the federal government has laid out. In North Carolina, we have 14 categories of disability under the IDEA, and I'm not gonna list them off for you. Uh, but they range from uh, blind to having autism. Um, so it really co covers the gamut, emotional disabilities, specific learning disabilities, and we even have a catch-all of other health impairment, which kind of covers any sort of medical or health issue that has a significant impact on your education. Um, so it's, it's pretty comprehensive, but it is those specific categories, and you have to fit the definition of those categories. And they have very specific criteria, and so sometimes we have parents say, I know that my student needs special education services. So okay, let's do an evaluation, let's go through the eligibility process, and we end up saying, well, no, they don't meet this criteria, and they get very upset. It's like, no, 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 we're not done. We're not done. There are other categories. Hang on, they just didn't meet this one. Uh, so now let's look at this one, and now let's look at this one, and, and then you walk through that process. So sometimes um, there's, there's that gap in, in, in understanding of just because you didn't meet this, car this uh, category criteria doesn't mean you won't get services under another one. And once you're eligible, the IEP can look however the team wants to make it look. Uh, there's no like, oh, if you got in the category of autism, then your IEP looks like this, or if you got specific learning disability, then it looks like No. Once you're eligible, we design a plan for you. Because every specific learning disability in math looks a little different. And every child with autism presents a little differently, has different needs. So we don't write a, an IEP for a student with autism. We write an IEP for your student. Um, so the second bullet here is, sorry, I'm covering that up. Um, the second bullet is really, really important. Because again, just as in 504, you can have students who have a technical uh, disability, disability under a technical definition but they don't require accommodations or modifications for equal access to the program. In the same way, in the IDEA, you may have a student who meets one of those 14 categories, right? They're diagnosed with autism. Easy, we're in it, we're, we're there, right? You're eligible. But they don't require any specialized instruction. They're doing absolutely fine. So if you don't require specially designed instruction as a result of your disability, then even though you have that disability, you're not eligible under uh, the IDEA for services. Uh, so, which it makes sense, right? We don't want to say, that, oh, well, because your doctor diagnosed you with autism, you must have this IEP, right? You must go through all these processes. Well, so, no, I'm fine. Right? We, so we don't want to place that burden on anybody. Like, if, if you're doing great, then we're not gonna uh, go through that process. So, eligibility. The, you have to meet the definitions, and then you have to hit these two as well, right? So you're in the 14, there has to be an adverse effect on your educational performance. It has to actually mean do something to your education, uh, some sort of barrier as a result of your disability. And then there has to be this need for specialized instruction. And what does that mean? I think I have a slide. No, I don't have a slide on that one. Uh, that's one of the ones that got cut. So what is specially designed instruction? It, it means more than accommodating or modifying, right? In 504, we're modifying, we're giving you some extended time, we're changing your seating, we're providing some visual supports. Um, we are changing your schedule a little bit. So again, if you have social anxiety and you were really struggling with transitions with hundreds of kids in the hallway, we can set up a modification where you leave the classroom three minutes early and you get to your next classroom before it gets crowded in the hallway. Um, 
those are just accommodations, modifications. We can change the way we present your homework to you um, in either you know, fewer problems or more visual, or you only have to do every other problem because of a, of a pacing issue, whatever that may be. We can do that. That's all just modifying, accommodating. That doesn't change the instruction in any way. Um, what the IDEA requires is that there's something about this student's disability, the way this presents in the educational environment, that requires us to change the way that we teach in order to better instruct uh, this student, to better enable them to make progress in the general curriculum. Uh, so that, this is a huge piece, and this, we get hung up on this in IEP meetings all the time. You know, again, you have parents, they say, well, I, my kid clearly has a uh, specific learning disability in reading. So, yes, you're right, they do. Um, and they're clearly messing with their education. They're not doing well in reading. Yes, you're right. But what does the specialized instruction look like for that student? And if we can't come up with that, right, if there's nothing there, if they are accessing the general curriculum appropriately, even with their disability, then they're not going to require specialized instruction. They may require accommodations, modifications, and then we shift back to 504. Right? If they don't require specialized instruction, it doesn't mean they get nothing. It means okay, we don't have to change the way we teach. How do we change the environment? How do we change the structures? so that we remove those barriers. So it, it is all just a kind of a balance. We gotta look at what that is. And your question here. So hypothetically, um, then doesn't this say that, okay, so what I've heard, okay, how do I phrase it? Um, the, the, what I've heard sometimes is this, me providing this specialized instruction is unfair because you're asking me to do something that's different than the rest of the class. I mean, I mean, not just specifically in school, but like just in general, this is the attitude a lot of organizations kind of take this attitude towards providing right. specialized, specialized quote unquote, anything, right? Um, and so I guess the question is like, how do we even begin to address that attitude? It's like, yeah, by definition, the child has an IEP, they should be receiving specialized instruction. Mm -hmm. An instructor is saying, that's not my job to give specialized instruction. I have enough to do. Right, right. So uh, let me separate a couple of things there, um, and I'm going to take off my lawyer hat and yeah. put on my policy hat for a second. Um, <laughs> and so again, with that caveat. So one, we have a cultural issue, right? We have a pervasive cultural issue in this country about fairness. And it seems very often the people who are already ahead are the ones complaining about unfairness. Um, and that applies across disability, it applies across ethnicity and race. It, 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 it always seems to be the people who are in the best position. who are like, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. Why do they get that? Um, and so I think that that's a cultural problem. And that's something we need to be addressing. Uh, it's something we need to be having conversations about. It's one of the reasons why a course like this is so important um, to, to uh, engender that conversation and, and provide space for that so that people can begin to understand where they are advantaged. And maybe disadvantaged, right? Because that's the other one that people think as soon as I have one disadvantage, that means that I, you know, everyone is ahead of me. But no, everybody has advantages. Everybody has disadvantages. Some people have multiple disadvantages. Um, and uh, I think probably people in this are in a much better place to talk about intersectionality than I. But uh, we're cognizant of those things. I'm not my stomach. Um, so, um, I've got 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, that policy piece, yes, there are teachers who will respond inappropriately with that type of statement. Um, it's not accurate, and hopefully through training and education, we are moving our, moving those teachers toward that. that. That's not something I think the majority of teachers would say, particularly teachers who are engaged in special education. Uh, but I have heard it, and it's unfortunate, and it's wrong. Uh, Okay, so what does the IEP process look like, right? So once we have a child, this child may have a disability. Um, what do we need to do? The first thing we need to do is we need to find that child and we need to take a look at whether they may be a qualifying uh, student. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, if somebody who's watching remotely, check your mic if you're kind of coughing, sneezing, and, and mute that for us. Thanks. Um, so what we need to be doing is first finding out if this student is someone with a disability. And the way we do that is we go through an evaluation process. The team gets together, they talk to the parent, they talk to the teachers, say, what's going on with this student? 
right? What are the issues? What are their needs? How is it presenting in class? And then what do we need to do in terms of formal testing to try to figure out what to do here? And we'll do, you know, psychological evaluation. We'll do an educational evaluation. We can do an occupational therapy evaluation. We can do a medical evaluation. There's a whole host of different kinds of evaluations that we can do. And for each of those 14 categories of disability, there's a list of, of, of evaluations we have to do to think about whether that student qualifies as a student with autism or qualifies as a student with another uh, other health impairment, <coughs> things like that. So we then say, okay, we think they might have a specific learning disability. Okay, what are the evaluations we need to do for learning disability? We do those. Uh, you can pause it. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to talk on this slide for a while, so we're good. So we're going to do those evaluations, and they're going to be done by by specialists within the school system if we have them. Right? We have psychologists. We have occupational therapists. Um, if we need something really, really specialized, we may have to send out for it. Uh, and that's okay. So we do those evaluations, we bring the results back, team gets back together. And they sit down, they go through the eligibility process. And that's where you go through and talk about, here's what we found out from our evaluations. Here's what we've observed in the school system. Here's what you're observing at home. Um, here's what the community folks that are, that are with you are observing. And how we kind of roll that all together and say, does this meet the criteria for other health impairment? Does this meet the criteria for specific learning disability? Does this meet the criteria for emotional disability? And if it does, then we're going to move to those other questions, which is adverse impact on their education and need for special design instruction. So let's assume for the moment we answer yes to all of those. Right? We've got a student who is um, has a specific learning disability in reading, adversely impacts their education, and we decide they do need some sort of specially designed instruction for a portion of their day in order to make progress and access the general curriculum. Now we need to develop an IEP, right, which is an individualized education plan, or some people use program instead of plan. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, it's an IEP. And what that IEP is about is about describing who that student is as a student, what their needs are, and how we're going to address those needs. It's, it's really that simple. Right? What are the needs? How are we going to do it? Now, there's, there are some forms, and North Carolina has its own forms, so other states do it differently, that we walk through to make sure the team is doing a really comprehensive look at that. Um, but at the end of the day, you're just trying to design a plan that describes the student, including their needs, their strengths, their needs, and then describes how we're going to address those needs, how we're going to move them forward. So this student with our specific disability in reading, we decide they need you know, 60 minutes of <clears throat> specialized instruction in reading, and we're going to set some goals for them because they're really struggling with decoding. So we're going to set up some special design instruction for decoding. Five minutes. Yeah, we're good. Um, and that's going to help us to figure out, okay, how do we do this? And set it for an IP. It's supposed to be a one-year document, right? So we got to set a goal <coughs> for one year. And it's an ambitious goal, right? We want to push the student because typically we're intervening because they're a little bit behind. So we want to push them. They need to catch up. They need to be moving faster than their non-disabled peers if we can manage it. So, but it also needs to be attainable. Right? We don't just say, oh, you're three years behind. Well, our IEP is going to set the grade level standard, and you need to make up those three years in a year. That's ridiculous. <coughs> so you set an ambitious goal, but an attainable goal. And that's where I think you all read the summary of Andrew F., which was the recent uh, Supreme Court decision that sort of uh, clarified that faith obligation, when I say faith, free appropriate public education, that is the sort of uh, legal standard that we're, we're after. And um, so in order to do that, we need to be meeting a student where they are, but then really pushing them. So how are we setting goals and providing services that are ambitious but attainable uh, for those students? And that's the IEP. Once we've got an IEP, right, you just got, you know, IEP training is like six hours. You just got that in the few <laughs> seconds. Um, then we have to actually follow up on it, right? We don't just give them a plan. Here's your, here's your IEP. Bye. Good luck. Um, now we're providing services. And it's going to be a special. It's going to be an EC licensed teacher, right? An exceptional children's licensed teacher <coughs> who has to provide those services. We can't just hand that to the regular math teacher. They're not trained to do it, right? The math teacher is going to participate, uh, but we also need a special education licensed teacher to be providing those services. It may be in the classroom. It may be in a pullout setting. They may get pulled out uh, into a smaller setting with four or five students. It might be one on one, and they might be working on reading. They might be working on behavior, right? They might be working on self care. Uh, it can be whatever that student needs in order to fully function and, and make progress in their education. So progress monitoring means now that we've got the plan, we're doing the plan, now we're tracking it to make sure it works. 
So we're following the student with their goals, we're measuring their performance uh, in a number of different ways, and then we're checking it, hopefully, and coming back <coughs> and adapting as we need to. Um, then the annual review means we come back at the end of one year, and we say, okay, how'd we do? How's he doing? Okay, well that worked, that didn't work, how do we change? Are we ready to move the goals forward now? Let's push them out another year. And again, ambitious but attainable, still trying to move them toward uh, the catching up to their non-disabled peers, not always uh, possible uh, in one year. And then the reevaluation just means every three years we go back and we do the psychological evaluation again, we do the occupational therapy evaluation again, because now that information is old. Students change um, over time, and so we do that every three years. Um, and what, I've got two minutes here? Okay, <laughs> so you'll be able to see these slides. The IEP team has to have specific people in it. The one I'm gonna highlight is the parent. Mm -hmm. Parent is a really important process. The whole ID, IDEA is built around including the student and the parent in the decision-making process. Uh, so they're, they're a critical member of the team. When do children join? Uh, they can come at any time. I've been in IEP meetings with eight-year-olds. Uh, they are uh, they begin to be required to be notified, and I give the opportunity around age 14. Um, and then at, eight, at 18, they take over the rights, the actual decision-making rights from their parents. But you know, typically, it's not until they get into high school that we have students who are actively participating, and even then, it's not that common. Um, but then at 18, they actually take over uh, the procedural rights from their parents. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about the IEP. We don't have a ton of time on this, but basically, all this all folds into where are the constraints and needs, what goals are we going to that are ambitious but attainable? What services are we going to provide that's different from what everyone else gets to help them meet those goals and move forward in the general curriculum if possible? Um, and then are we going to do any related services, speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, things that schools don't normally, quote, unquote, normally teach um, that this student needs in the school environment to succeed? We have to provide that. Um, and so we have occupational therapists on staff. We have physical therapists, typically not one per school, but they have a lot of lighter caseload. Uh, <coughs> Per school, and so then they move around. So not a lot of kids live in general, but fewer students per school, so they have covered more schools. Uh, speech therapy, another huge one there. Uh, this is the last thing I'll touch, and then I think I will stop. And that is the the controversy over least restrictive environment. This is another, another two-hour topic that I'll do in 20 seconds. Um, <laughs> the bottom line here is that students with disabilities have a right to be educated with their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent appropriate, and that's a really important word. Right, that we have people who say, no, my child has a right to be in the general classroom. No, not accurate. They have a right to be educated with their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent appropriate. Sometimes that's 100% of the day. Sometimes it's 0% of their day. It depends on the child. Um, and, and so, but the burden is on, excuse me, the staff, the people that are, and maybe the parents actually as well, but whomever is proposing the removal to be able to articulate why. Right? So it's not why should I be in the general classroom, it's why not. Right? So, so the, the presumption is general education population, general education classroom, remove only if absolutely necessary. Um, so we think about what are the ways that we can keep the student in the general education classroom, and if we have to, then what is the minimal, or what is the, the minimum amount of time we pull them out in order to make sure that they're making progress toward their goals. Uh, Whitney Hughes from online asked, are there any legal obligations for private schools, or are there only protections in public schools? Mm -hmm. So, great question. I do not interact with private schools, so I'm not in a great position to talk about the nuance of that, um, but the IEPs will often follow students. Uh, charter schools absolutely have special education responsibilities consistent with the IDEA. Um, private schools generally do not. Uh, but they often provide it anyway, in, in some form or other. There's also, and this is getting way too known, there are situations where the, the public school has to provide special education services to private school students, even though they're not attending the public school system. Query that for a bit. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that is part of the law as well. Um, so I think that's, that's what we're going to get to. Okay, this is your parents. I didn't talk about the due process at all. Maybe I'll hang around for the break and we can yeah. talk about that if necessary. Um, but parents can sue if they're not happy and then I get called, and we try to figure out, one, how do we stay out of court, because there's better things to spend our money on than lawyers, namely educated kids. Um, but, but then two, you know, if we have to go to court, then, we, then the lawyers get involved, and, and off we go. Um, but that, that is always available to the parents. So I'm gonna stop there, and... Uh, <coughs>
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Jeff to come back and we'll do this again. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask once again that if you're at home, you make sure that you are muted or in your <laughs> office, please make sure you're muted um, because we can't, because we're recording, we can't turn over hosting to someone else. Um, <laughs> The slides for this yeah. lecture are available on the website, cedi.web.unc.edu. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, it's happy, happy, happy to be joining you, Jennifer Bills. Um, all the caveats. Um, the Steve said, I'm not giving legal advice here. I have way too much information to cover than I have time for. <laughs> um, and I'm going beyond the kind of school context. I will talk about employment in the workplace and also address um, some other uh, ac disability access issues covered by other parts of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is community access and access to um, private entities. So again, uh, there's going to be a little overlap. I'm going to fly through a bunch of technical slides but it's there for you. Um, if you want to stop me, do. Um, but I'm going to try to cover as much as possible. So um, a lot of this is pretty basic, and I know that you're sort of early in the semester, but um, as you're you know, developing your vocabulary on talking about disability, just some of the types of disabilities, physical, mental, very specific ones, such as traumatic brain injury, think about um, other specific diagnoses, but also um, in the legal context, even if you don't have a label or a name of a disease or a diagnosis, if you have some limitations that are functional, you're, you may qualify for legal protections as well. So, um, you know, Steve also mentioned there's some cultural uh, context to dealing with disability and legal rights of people with disabilities. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, just want to give a shout out to all the folks with disabilities who have fought for disability rights um, for many, many decades, mostly getting started in the 60s, but um, it's the result of activism by people with disabilities that we have the legal protections that we do today in many areas. Um, putting their bodies literally on the line in the courthouses and the legislatures to advocate for greater protection. Um, Lots of laws in this country impact people with disabilities. Um, again, beginning in the 60s, you have the Architectural Barriers Act, the Rehabilitation Act, um, which Section 504 is part of. Um, you have the, pre the precursor to the IDEA. Um, there's a specific voting law. There's a specific law <laughs> governing air carrier access. Uh, specific laws around housing. Um, other laws that touch on disabilities such as the Family Medical Leave Act, um, which affords leave for disability, um, and the GINA, which prevents discrimination based on genetic information. But the main law that I'm going to talk to you about today is the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and it is a federal civil rights law, like Section 504, as Steve mentioned, and it, and it, but it does impose an affirmative require, requirement, too. Um, as Dr. Gibson was mentioning, and so we're going to get into that a little bit because it doesn't just say don't discriminate. It actually does um, include some requirements that that you have to do certain things to make the playing field even. Um, so um, mainly, it's about removing barriers and preventing discrimination. Um, it was passed with really bipartisan support and signed by a Republican president, um, and it still enjoys. Um, some, some bipartisan support, but there um, are also uh, difference of opinion about it and how effective it is. Uh, in fact, when it was first enacted, after it was first enacted, courts began construing, as Steve said, there's not a list of things that are that count as disabilities in the law. And so courts were very narrowly construing the law and saying, well, you don't even, we're not even discuss about the protections it's going to provide because you don't qualify as a person with a disability. And that went on for almost two decades, and Congress came back, and, and they don't often do this, but Congress said, no, 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 actually, we meant it. This is supposed to be a civil rights statute. We want it to, available to provide, you know, protect people's rights and provide protection, and so we're, we're strengthening it. We're clarifying some of the points. They still didn't have a list of uh, 
disabilities, but they made it a lot clearer um, that they really meant it, and it's supposed to provide broad, broad coverage. And so most people, um, if they have to go to court, they don't get kicked out at the stage of do you even qualify for protection under this law. Um, and one of the one of the major changes was, um, as Steve also mentioned, mitigating measures, and those are things from eyeglasses to medication that actually um, help a person function better. Um, sometimes, sometimes to the point where they don't need um, an accommodation. However, what was happening before is like, oh, if you have a mitigating measure that that helps correct your vision or your hearing or whatever, then you don't qualify under the act. And so this, the amendments act clarifies it. No, you're co you're covered. Let's then talk about what you need. So um, you have to understand what is meant by a person with disability within the act. Uh, we're going to go over some of the parts of the Americans with Disabilities Act, talk a little more about reasonable modification and accommodation, um, and I've thrown in some other laws uh, for reference. So the three main titles I'm going to talk about today, Title I covers employment, that's just in the workplace, um, schools and others. Um, for staff. Uh, Title II covers state and local government services and programs, and Title III um, is sort of er er other things, everything else, like uh, accessing restaurants or hotels or anything, um, any private entity that makes itself open to the public, so we call public accommodation. So um, I'll just spend a minute here that um, within the ADA, um, it does cover a, an individual with a disability. We're going to talk. We're going to break that down, that definition. Um, but it also covers somebody who might not currently have a disability that's impacting them in a significant way, but they have a record of it. Maybe they have a past history of a mental illness or some other condition that's really in remission or it's, it's really not impacting them currently, but there's a record of it somewhere, and an employer or other party can discriminate based on that that writing and that record that they have had a disability. Um, a person can also be regarded as having a disability. So you might have been in a car accident and have a big scar that's very visible, but it doesn't significantly limit, you know, any of your functional um, abilities. And so it's not necessarily going to qualify as a disability to get you covered under the act, but it might be the basis for someone discriminating against you. And so you're going to get coverage under here as well if, you're, if you prove that you were regarded as disabled and that's the basis for the action. You can also get protection if you, by having an association with a person with a disability. So if you have a child, a parent, spouse, sibling with a disability, and that's known, and someone takes action on the basis of your association, maybe you need a lot of leave to take care of a child with a disability or something like that, um, which otherwise would be protected. Um, but if you face discrimination because of that association, you might get coverage under the Act. And then the Act specifically, um, protects against retaliation, and so if you're asserting your rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, engaging in what's called protected activity, uh, such as requesting a reasonable accommodation or complaining about uh, treatment or something like that, um, and then adverse action gets taken against you, you may have a claim for retaliation based on um, this law. Um, so, uh, again, I won't linger here. Uh, you've seen the definition. It has to be a substantial limitation of major life activities, a record regarded as. Um, there are some specific exceptions. Um, if you're using illegal drugs, um, unfortunately, you're not covered, um, or maybe fortunately. Um, and, and there's an interesting example um, in my disability law class last semester when my students wrote about medicalized um, marijuana, and it's now in this very interesting uh, legal state because some states have, many states have legalized its use for medical purposes. However, the federal government still have not. Mm -hmm. And so um, its use is still considered illegal under federal law mm -hmm. and so generally probably not protected by the ADA. Um, so, sorry. Um, let's talk about Title I employment. Um, it does apply to public and private employers. Um, who have 15 or more employees. So it does cover all aspects of employment, such as applying for a job. Somebody might need an accommodation in the setting of an interview, and, and you're covered. Um, it covers all the way through uh, your employment, um, and some 
possibly after you are no longer employed if there's some retaliation that's taking place that's like giving you a bad reference or something lingering from the employment relationship. It's possible it can carry over in minor situations past employment, but it's generally covering the employment relationship. Um, employers are only required to accommodate a known disability. So if you have an invisible disability, they don't know about it, they're not going to be held responsible for, for accommodating that. It's enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So you have to be a qualified individual with a disability in an employment law context. So it's not just that you have a disability and you think that you, there are some accommodations that might help you become qualified to do a job. You have to be qualified for the job. You have to have the requisite education or experience to be well, to meet the job requirements. And then if there is something, accommodation that you need in order to perform the essential functions of the job, then the ADA is going to be your friend here. Um, so there's a lot of litigation about what are essential functions and what are what does qualified mean, um, what are reasonable accommodations. We're going to talk about specifics there, um, but this is the basic definition. Here's some examples of what some courts have found to be major life activities. These were generally found after the law was initially enacted post ADA Amendments Act. A lot of additional um, activities have also been found. Uh, to be major life activities in this context. Am I going too fast? Great. Um, so substantially limits, um, it's not, if, it, if it is just a minor limitation, it might not qualify. If it is an impairment that is temporary, such as a broken bone, it might not be covered under this law. Um, but if it's a condition that's episodic that comes and goes, it probably will be covered. Um, and again, if, if you have the condition, even if, it's in, even if it's in remission or being currently mitigated, you're still going to qualify for coverage under the law. Um, regarded as, uh, again, this is one of the areas where courts were really narrowly construing the ADA initially. And they tied themselves in knots here because there were opinions. Um, if, a, if a person, an employee, was fired or something, um, faced adverse action, and claims that they were regarded as disabled, they not only had to claim that, they had to say, the employer regarded me as having this specific disabling condition, which substantially limited this major life activity. So you had to get into the mind of the employer and assume or you know speculate on how they were exactly precisely discriminating in regarding you as a person with disability. That is no longer required. If you show that they regarded me as X, you know, or limited in a certain way, that's going to be enough for regarded as at this point. Again, mitigating measures can be anything. They can be um, prosthetics. They can be medicine. Um, anything that um, addressing the condition, it's not going to count against you for coverage under this act. So the accommodation principle is really important in this law, in the, in the employment context and in others, um, and it is an affirmative uh, civil rights obligation, and there's no funding attached to it, but it does impose an obligation on employers and, and public entities and some private entities to adjust things, their usual course of business and how they usually do things. Change the physical space that they have. Um, give longer time. Um, modify rules and things. Because the principle behind the ADA is they are trying to um, e equalize opportunity, right? And um, so if you, if you have the job but you can't access the health insurance benefits because you have to pass some kind of medical test to get covered or something like that. You're not being treated the same as an employee who doesn't have a disability who can easily pass some kind of fitness test to get you covered, either for insurance or some other wellness program or benefit. Okay, so they're gonna. This is a law to help even the praying field. It does require some affirmative obligations in order to do that. So, what are some reasonable accommodations under the ADA? Um, 
you can't be denied an opportunity uh, because you need a reasonable accommodation. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get the reasonable accommodation you ask for or, or want. Um, there's going to be some balancing of costs and what's reasonable to the employer, what's not a burden on the employer. Um, but you can't be required to accept a separate benefit. So um, it can't be considered an undue hardship. Again, this highly litigated area of what an employer considers an undue hardship, what an employee might think is an undue hardship on the employer's business. But they're going to balance costs. They're going to consider the size of the employer, whether it's a small employer or a large employer, and sort of relatively speaking, how that cost will fall. Um, and generally, larger employers with bigger budgets are going to be required to do a little more. So the process of requesting an accommodation as an employee, um, again, it can come before uh, you're hired during an interview process, trying to access an application online or something. It can cover employees who are part-time, full-time, even on a probationary status. There aren't any magic words to invoke the act, but again, employers aren't required to do anything if they don't know that there's a need. Um, and once there's a disclosure of a disability and a request for accommodation, it has to be kept confidential. Um, and there, what's, it ticks off this process, which is called an interactive process. So the employee and the employer are supposed to engage in a dialogue about what is reasonable and what's not an undue burden. And again, they may not start in the same place, but hopefully they can reach a compromise. Um, so if there's just one offer of, I'll get you an ergonomic desk, and if that's not really going to help me, it shouldn't end there. It should just go back and forth with, I have one I can bring in, but I need some help with the cost or, or, some, or need something moved around or whatever. There should be a dialogue about that. Um, and there really are um, burdens on both parties and res responsibilities of both parties there. want to flag that um, this is a really good resource, the Job Accommodation Network. It gets some federal funding um, from the Department of Labor and it's housed at West Virginia University, but they, you can go online and, um, and access them. You can call them, you can email them, you can chat online and ask, tell them what your situation is, what the disability is, what the limitation is, what the need is, and they will brainstorm with you. They have a catalog of accommodations that are frequently used in different places and they're just a free resource. They're available to employers and employees. Title II of the ADA governs um, state and local governments, so schools, of course, public schools. Um, any other state, city, county programs or activities that are offered, courts, um, council, city councils, uh, police and fire departments. State and local government entities may not refuse to allow a person to participate in a service program or activity because of their disability, and they're also required to make reasonable modifications um, to provide equal access. Can I just yes. So for those of us in here who are interested in libraries, this includes you, us, <laughs> we, whatever kind of space you're in. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so given that, I have a, I have a question. <laughs> What, what are, do you talk about some sort of standard practices that libraries engage in to make themselves more accessible? You may. <laughs> <laughs> As a former graduate, still, no. <laughs> what do you, what do you all think are some, some access issues that people have? What are some access issues in our, well, you won't call out. That you've seen any the specific library, <laughs> <laughs> hypothetically speaking. <laughs> what is the right. issues you might be able to think of? Staff training. Okay. So, in awareness to some of the situations I've had in the library that I manage, is that you know we have rules in place that are you know don't move the furniture, don't bring in this, and then we have people who come in. Can you help me move this chair? No, it's in our policy to not move a chair. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, you're asking because you have right disability and accommodation that's not. So staff waiting and traffic better communication. Excellent. What are some other access issues you all have seen or aware of in libraries? Very practical space issues. Things like um, spaces that have no room for a wheelchair to move in a mm -hmm. room, like we're in the main space of the library. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
no seating, no account, like no seating that also didn't accommodation. Um, you just reminded me of a little anecdote I usually tell in the beginning. I forgot to tell. I'm going to tell it now because it goes to the mentality and the culture around accommodation. So a friend of mine is a wheelchair user, and she does a lot of lecturing. And she always goes into the conference room or the auditorium, wherever she is, and she's like, you all have your accommodation of the seat right there. I brought my own. <laughs> <laughs> and she talks about her friend who uh, is blind, who wherever she goes, she's like, I don't need an accommodation of light. All of you sighted people need the accommodation of light. <laughs> but I, I don't need that light. You could save money if you had only blind people here in this room. You could save money on the <laughs> So just to get you thinking that, you know, accommodation on the one hand is sort of doing something affirmative. On the other hand, it's about universal access and design and evening playing fields. And so it all depends on your perspective, whether you need an accommodation of that seat or you bring your own, you know, or you don't need it. So um, this, this furniture is interesting and space is too. But I, I would argue that absolutely that, that the policy, you know, that's that's a basis for for amending that policy. If someone you know can, obviously can't access, can't get in a space, um, but even to move it for a specific reason, I think sounds reasonable. You know, given the context. Um, great, great input. Um, so it, sometimes it uh, the ADA will require uh, an entity to furnish auxiliary aids and services. Um, sometimes it might just require them to move furniture. Um, you can't impose any special charges on people, however, if what you need is some um, aid or service or, or change or move or something. Um, program access, um, people can't be excluded um, because of inaccessible buildings, so you're going to have to find a way to get that person into the library um, or, or bring the library to them in some way, um, but you're, you're not supposed to provide a separate benefit, so you're going to have to we have to figure that out. Um, and the obligation is there regardless of if a person comes into the door. The obligation is there for libraries to make themselves accessible. Um, so assistance can take the form of helping people, you know, specifically hands-on assistance with applications or, um, you know, specific offering sign language interpretation for tours of museums. Um, you know, if you have a person um, needing to participate, wanting to participate in a swim program, you know, it's not necessarily the case that everyone's going to get to participate in the same program if it's not going to be safe for them. The government entity might be able to provide a separate program if that's what's going to be the most appropriate and the most and the safest um, and the most reasonable. But that's always the last resort. Um, the, the goal is to make everything universally accessible. Um, you know, you can move a meeting to a different floor in a building um, or hold it somewhere else, a class somewhere else, a lecture somewhere else. Um, it doesn't say that every single part of the building has to be accessible necessarily, but you need certain parts to be accessible. Um, you need an alternative route to be able to access the same service or content program. And accommodations, again, are going to be anything really that will enable that person to access the same benefit or service or program that a person without a disability can. Um, again, the defense to that or the sort of limitation, outer limitation on that is going to be, does it fundamentally offer the program? So if it's, you know, offering a team sport and somebody, you know, if it's a golf class and um, you're walking around the green and somebody needs um, mobility assistance to use a uh, golf cart to access that, there have been cases about whether or not that actually fundamentally alters the, alters, uh, the, the service, the, the good, the, the game of golf, right? And there, there's some different opinions. They come down differently on that particular question. But it's going to be a discussion and a consideration of um, are you really opening up the access and making it um, available to people, or are you really changing what's actually going on um, so fundamentally that it's not the same thing? That's the, that's the balancing. Um, Public entities can't refuse um, participation because of disability, and they're required to make reasonable modifications um, to furnish aids and services, um, and can't um, 
impose an accommodation benefit, meaning if a person doesn't ask for it, um, it's not a you know problem to offer, but if they decline it, you can't impose it. Um, there's a really important case called Olmstead, um, which uh, was about people in uh, an institution for um, people with mental disabilities in Georgia um, many years ago, um, stuck in an institution basically, and they wanted access to services, rehabilitative services, but in the community. And so um, this is where, I think my next slide is, no, it's not my next slide, I'm gonna jump ahead. Oh, never mind. Um, this case stands for the proposition that the ADA actually requires, has an integration mandate. And so it's similar to some of the educational laws that Steve talked about in terms of the least restrictive environment and trying to make sure that the first option is definitely keeping people in the classroom with the general population. Similarly, government entities providing benefits and services to people with disabilities, the presumption should be do it in an integrated setting. Don't segregate people in an institution or segregate people on their own um, in order for them to re receive services. Quick note on service animals. Dogs are still, the only, last time I checked, is still the only officially recognized um, service animals, though there are um, comfort animals and emotional support animals that are often allowed through various, um, you know, it doesn't mean you can't bring um, another animal with you if you have one that's trained to alert um, for, for diabetes, sugar, or something like that. There are some other animals that have been allowed um, to be considered accommodations, but they're not officially recognized um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, when I was at Disability Rights, uh, we had a client um, who had a pig. Um, who helps them in terms of remaining calm. Pigs are very smart animals. And there was actually a municipal ordinance that prohibited pigs within the city limits um, of a particular town. And this is just something, she wasn't trying to take it to school or you know necessarily, but she had it and she would take it with her in various parts of the community and it was against the law. And so that was a really interesting case. So again, it's a case by case basis. Um, for animals, but generally, um, in the Title II and the Title III context, um, there's a little bit of flexibility, and it's expanding. Um, auxiliary aids and services can be, um, for, for libraries, maybe let's pause for a minute, they can be actual listening devices and headsets, they can be Braille. Um, have you guys seen Braille? Do you know what it is? Um, do you do you know other libraries you work in have many? Or just we just got them. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Um, large print. I mean, with with our modern technology, a lot of these things are pretty easy to to do sort of on the fly too. Um, but obviously, all kinds of alternative formats. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. To what extent? Do we provide these auxiliary aids and services? I know it's the reasonable accommodations, but like for a lot of the programs, as well as a lot of the tech, you know, we'll have one computer system that's set up for the entire system. You have, you know, eight locations, <coughs> one computer that's set up with the assistive technology. We've got, you know, a, a single program that has a translator available. You have assistive technology or uh, the the hearing devices available for a single event, but not every event we have. So to what extent? Are we required to have this set up, or can we do a disclaimer that just says accommodations available as requested? Okay, let, let me try to piece that apart a little bit. There's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can even get all of it. Okay. So, no, that's okay. I'm going to answer as much as I can. If I forgot something, remind me. So, in terms of every event, I would uh, definitely make it avail make sure that it's known that it's available for every event. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of how many, there's not a bright line rule that you have to have a certain number for a certain, you know, number of people, but there are, there's some guidance um, architecturally uh, with that. But in terms of auxiliary aids and services, it's, it's an individualized inquiry, right? Like for a certain one person who is deaf might need um, an ASL certified interpreter and another might be able to write uh, or see it in writing and that would be adequate for that person. Um, they might also have a friend 
or a family member who could interpret and kind of whisper in their ear, and that is their preferred method, which is also free to the <laughs> institution. Mm -hmm. And so these are pretty individualized inquiries, but in general, you want to definitely um, advertise that if there's a request, you know, please bring your request to us so that you can address it on an individual basis and then make other things such as the devices, you know, available generally. And there's a run on them and you run out, I mean, then you're going to have a, you know, an issue. Um, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? But um, generally, they should be based on the, the population. And you can do surveys. You can, you know, they, yeah. You know, surveys if, there's a run on, if there's a run on devices, then you know that you should have more devices. <laughs> yeah. Right. And maybe for some events more than others too. And maybe so maybe you can rent extra ones for certain events. You can you can try to gather the information in advance and have people request an accommodation ahead of time. That's the best way to prepare so that you don't, you know, so you are making it accessible. Um, I don't know if you have other thoughts, Steve, but I think you'll cover it. <laughs> okay, I saw you nod your head. Um, all right. So again, a, a, for deaf individuals, the ADA does not say that a qualified sign language, sign language interpreter has to be provided in every case. Okay, it's going to be, you have some cost benefit analysis. It's going to depend a little bit on the uh, context and the individual themselves. But some, in some instances, a qualified sign language interpreter will be required. Um, and what's important is um, that they are adequately conveying, you know, communication back and forth. Um, here's another reference to the 504, again, uh, and that uses some antiquated language, handicapped persons, um, may require different treatment in order to be afforded equal access. So you can point somebody who's complaining about providing specialized instruction, <laughs> it's the law, that's why, um, because it does. It, it requires affirmative action um, be taken to, again, to even the playing field and avoid discrimination in some cases. Transportation, um, obviously provided by public <laughs> entities, um, is required to be accessible. Um, so buses and trains um, need to have some accessible elements, but for many people, um, it, it's just it's not a, a feasible for them to access mainline transportation. And so um, most cities and towns and public entities provide what's called paratransit, which is specific kind of individualized service for people. And um, a good friend of mine is a sort of a transit activist here in the Chapel Hill um, Harborough area. And we now have a board, an advisory board um, for paratransit. Um, and the a number of accessible buses, I just heard the statistic recently, um, has increased, you know, Thousands by thousands. We have we have a lot of access to here. It's, I'm not saying it's enough necessarily, but um, cities and towns and public entities, um, you know, have this obligation. But sometimes they have to be pushed a little bit to to put the resources there. Um, this is the slide I was looking for. So this was a 1999 case, and um, when I was at Disability Rights, I was litigating under this case all the time because um, the state gets federal funds funding to provide for um, Medicaid and other services for people with disabilities, and there's not enough to go around. <laughs> and so um, often people get um, have to receive services in settings which are not as <coughs> integrated as they should be. And so um, the standard really is in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of the individual. Again, individualized. It's not going to be a test you can point to for somebody with specific diagnosis or disability. It's going to be their uh, individualized to their needs. Um, but there is a right to have the, to live in the most integrated setting, like there is a right to be educated in the least restrictive environment. Kind of the analog um, and avoid segregation. Courts. Um, must be accessible again, so universal design and physical accessibility. Um, many courts have an ADA coordinator. This is a really cool um, video about courts in Michigan becoming more accessible. You can check it out. Um, law enforcement is covered too, and um, th this is another hotly litigated area. So, the extent to which the ADA covers law enforcement interaction with people with disabilities is, is not settled. 
um, in every area. And so there are a lot of exigencies, there are a lot of safety considerations, there's a lot of danger in, in law enforcement interactions with individuals. There are obviously weapons involved frequently. And so, you know, there's some gray areas here, but generally speaking, you know, if you're a person with disability, you're arrested, you're deaf or something, you can't understand what they're, the commands that they're giving to you. They're supposed to, you know, you need to find a way to communicate that, that you can't understand the commands. But then th there's an obligation and the onus is going to be on that entity to make sure that they are effectively communicating with you in the effect of an arrest or whatever, investigation, whatever it is. Um, courts are not necessarily required to sort of pay for or provide transportation to the courthouse. That might be another public entity's responsibility, but they have to make themselves accessible. Um, public entities, uh, this is enforced in, uh, different by the Department of Justice, Department of Transportation, Department of Education. Um, <clears throat> people can file individual complaints. Um, Title III, I'm gonna, I have a few minutes to cover this. Um, so this again is um, your libraries too, to be private libraries, um, open to the public. So any place or space which is open to the public, with or without a fee, um, exception would be some private clubs, don't get covered. Um, but uh, it says public, so it's kind of confusing, but this is re really referring to private entities, but who make themselves open to the public. So that's the so public accommodation refers to a private entity making themselves open to the public. So they can't deny services or goods because the person has a disability. They can't offer unequal or separate benefits or services. They're supposed to be in the most integrated setting. Um, and, you know, think of an insurance company or something you can't contract or use administrative methods to have the effect of discriminating even if it's not overt. You're going to look at the impact that the policy has. Um, you can offer some special programs again um, as long as you open up the general programs too to people with disabilities to have a choice. So the physical access requirements um, mostly can be found in these regulations called ADAG, the ADA access guidelines. That some states have even stricter requirements, but they're very specific down to how wide the door has to be, how many inches up the door handle has to be, and how you can move it. Um, so these are very, very specific guidelines, which are really helpful to businesses and entities. Um, public accommodations that are being remodeled um, really then open themselves up to coming into compliance with all of, all of these guidelines. Um, there's no grandfather provision, so it's not that they don't apply if you're not modifying your business, but they kind of don't apply as much, and you don't have their obligations are not to do as much, but there is still some affirmative obligation for facilities to try to make themselves accessible if it's achieve, readily achievable or not totally expensive. Um, and again, it's going to be kind of a balancing of costs there. They're also going to look at the budget. budget um, I understood that you might want to talk a little bit about web and internet accessibility, so I have just a few couple slides on that. We have five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so these are not, uh, this doesn't have the force of law, it's not an official regulation, but these are some guidelines, web content accessibility guidelines, that the Department of Justice generally uses, frequently relies on, um, when they're going to look at a website to see if it's accessible. And um, this this, per, this presentation is available to you all, so you don't have to quickly copy down the this, this slide information. But um, using alt text and titling different images, um, consistent and clear formatting, um, avoid the high contrast color schemes. I threw in a couple of photos here, but generally it's text. Um, is so we have two sessions on web accessibility. Um, but I, I do want to kind of point to how that's grounded in our understanding of physical like accessibility of a physical space. Mm -hmm. right? And we'll talk in more detail about the web accessibility. Good. So you have a whole class or yeah. more than one on this. Okay. So this is just your introduction. Good. So um, the principles that um, these guidelines are for, for things to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, but we'll go into way more detail on that. Um, 
Some differences among the different titles in the ADA, um, again, have to do with how much they have to do, how much affirmative obligation there is to kind of become accessible. Um, and um, public entities have fewer obligations than private ones. Um, and um, Title III entities must comply with ADAG, Title, T, Title II entities can choose between another set of guidelines. Um, this is a cute little video about Title III accessibility that I'm not going to say today. <laughs> um, relief, so what the statute provides, um, again, you can, in some under some of the provisions, you can go to court only after you first go to the administrative uh, agency to file an administrative complaint. Um, other provisions allow you to go straight to court. Other provisions are really generally enforced by the government. So individuals can appeal to the government to try to help enforce the law. Um, one other law is um, within the Help America Vote Act is a provision called the Protection and Advocacy for Voting Accessibility. And so these are specific pr protections that apply to people trying to access the vote <laughs> at polling places. And sadly, um, there's a 7% gap um, across the country for people, um, voters with disabilities, and, and in North Carolina, it's double that. So we have a lot of work to do here um, to make that more accessible for people. I mean, once uh, when I was a disability rights one year, we um, decided to visit every all 100 counties and to check some polling places in, in each of them. And <laughs> words can't describe some of the settings, and you know, we have a lot of rural counties here, so it's it's difficult. But even simple, you know, schools and churches and courthouses that are being used have steps going up to them, <laughs> or have huge, you know, curb issues. And um, so there's other things like curbside voting. You can vote from your car. You can vote absentee. There are other provisions or alternative ways to access voting, but we still have a long way to go. I think that's the end. Questions? Yes. Um, I've been thinking about public and private spaces. Where do these services like Google and Airbnb fall in terms of what they're That's a great question. So, um, those are private companies, right? And so they would be governed by Title III as public accommodations. But are you asking about um, it, it's kind, kind of, of like what the burden is, like where the onus falls? I mean, I've heard some horror stories. I think that this is a new area, and um, those companies, I'm, I don't know what the level of awareness is at, at the company level, but it's a lot of independent contractors. Are they really you know, employees of the company? I mean, there are going to be so many issues there. Um, I would argue that, that, it's a, that it's a company providing a public accommodation, and the ADA applies, and so if a person with disability requests, um, accessible transportation, they should have somehow, and I'm not, I don't use it frequently, so I don't know how to access it in terms of the mobile app or whatever, but there should be some way to indicate you need an accessible vehicle. They should make sure that they have in, within their fleet, you know, again, the number that's going to be appropriate to that population so that they can respond. I, I don't know how that's going. You can imagine the problem. <laughs> yes, it's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> Questions? Right at the time. Well, I'm going to say thank you. Okay. We're going to turn off our recording. We're going to take a minute break before we come back to the questions.